place you probably shouldn't be. Okay, let's oh, get fine. out of here. Yeah, she knows instinct instinctually the one place like she probably shouldn't be, and then she's like, let me go there. That looks interesting. It's a true story. Virtual. Look. There we go. Yeah, that's that's gonna be better for the virtual. and Schlafly Public Library presents Kate Pice and Jonathan B. Losses uh, to celebrate the release of beloved Missouri children's book author Pice's How Mr. Silver Stole the Show, which just came out. This is based on a true story that happened right here in St. Louis. How Mr. Silver Stole the Show is a heartwarming story that is certain to be a story time favorite. 
We are so lucky to be joined this evening by Jonathan B. Lossus, uh, also celebrated St. Louis author. So tonight is going to be an incredible evening full of cats, which is my favorite kind of evening. Tonight's event is possible because of your support. When you support Love Bank Books, your money goes directly into the local economy. It helps keep our bookstore open, but it also helps keep the streets paved, the parks free, and, of course, keeping your libraries funded, which is very important to keep Schlafly here. And many other things, your money goes and does a very fantastic thing by spending it locally. I would like to thank you all for shopping local and for supporting this event. We do have books available for sale in the back of the room. We also want to welcome our virtual audience. Hello, virtual audience. I know you are back there. I am Shane Mullen. I am the event coordinator for Love Thing Books. I help produce our hundreds of author events each year with a fantastic team here in St. Louis. We are almost done with events for the year. We only have a couple left, uh, but be sure to keep an eye out on our event calendar for really fantastic things that we have planned for next year. For the kids, I will say that during the CWD window walk that is coming up, uh, I think the first one is this Saturday, but then they, on uh, Saturday, December 2nd, uh, local author Beth Bacon will be joining us, and I'm in talks with another local author for uh, the night. So be sure to, if you like story time, there will be some fun things going on at the store. And we will be doing many hours of story times during the day to help celebrate the end of walk. Now, about the star of the show, tonight's book. We have two that I will be discussing, but How Mr. Silver Stole, stole the Show. Everyone loves an underdog, especially when he's a cat. On a rainy morning in 1947, how much of this should I say? I think I might let you. A lot of this is going to be talked about in the presentation, uh, but I will say that you can curl up with this heartwarming story based on a real-life stray cat who made international headlines just by showing up, being himself, and finding a little kindness. And then also tonight, we will be discussing the cat's meow. Uh, the Washington Post calls the book engaging and wide-ranging. The Cat's Meow is a readable and informed exploration of the wild cat that lurks within Fluffy. Fluffy was actually the name of my childhood cat. <laughs> the past, present, and future of the world's most popular and beloved pet from a leading evolutionary biologist and a cat and a great cat lover. About our authors. Kate Cleese and illustrator in Sarah of Kleiss. <laughs> Uh, Kate Kleiss and illustrator M. Sarah Kleiss are sisters who began making books together as children in the bedroom they shared in Peoria, Illinois. Their home was always filled with paper, art supplies, and cats, most of whom arrived as strays and quickly became beloved members of the Kleiss family. Since then, Kate and Sarah have created more than 30 books for young readers, many inspired by animals. Kate's books for Bible and Friends include Mystery on Magnolia Circle, which takes place here in St. Louis, Grounded, Homesick, and Stay, A Girl, a Dog, a Bucketlist, also illustrated by Kate, by Sarah, M. Sarah Kleiss. Jonathan B. Lawless. Lawless is an evolutionary biologist at Washington University and the founding director of the Living Earth Collaborative a unique biodiversity center and partnership between Washington University, the St. Louis Zoo, and the Missouri Botanical Garden. He was previously a professor of biology at Harvard and a curator at the University's Museum of Comparative Zoology. He has won awards from the National Academy of Sciences, the Society for the Study of Evolution, and the American Society of Naturalists. So now, on behalf of Left Bank Books and Schlafly Public Library, will you all please help me in warmly welcoming, first up, Kate Kleiss. Uh, it's really 
really fun to be here this time of year because I, when I look at these young faces, I started, didn't wait till I was an old lady to make books. I started writing books when I was your age. Especially this age. How old are you right here? Yes. Seven or eight? Nine? Six? I guess, I guess too old. But I, I always guess old for kids. Uh, but I started making books when I was 10 years old, and I made them as Christmas gifts for my siblings. And um, I will confess that my first book ended up in garbage can, another older sister. Uh, but it made me very comfortable with rejection. So Jonathan's book is all about facts. I'm not that, um, I usually start with a little fact and then um, spin out from there. But for those of you kids who are looking for the perfect gift to give a parent for Christmas or Hanukkah or whatever you celebrate, I want to suggest you write a book. And I want to teach you guys how I do it. I often start with a little headline they see in the newspaper. So this is a story I read during COVID. So the date on it is November 17, 2021. So this is two years ago. Yeah. I saw an article in the paper that said, a stray cat struts into the St. Louis cat show and becomes a winner. So I, I clicked on this image and look at this lady holding this kitty. I mean, they, look at the kitty's paws. He looks like, what just happened, doesn't he? And she has such an expression on her face. It's almost like, it's almost like the opposite of the Mona Lisa. Right? It's not a mysterious little smile. This is a great big exuberant smile. So when I'm starting a story, I'm always looking for two things. I'm always looking for change in a, in a character, and I'm looking for emotion. And so this is a story about a, an alley cat. You can read along. An alley cat that wandered into the Hamilton Hotel at 956 Hamilton Avenue two days before the Greater St. Louis Cat Club Show was being held there. Won first prize in the best color for kittens class and first prize in the non champion class at the show yesterday. This is kind of a clunky article, but basically, it's this little kitty snuck into a hotel and this nice lady entered him in the cat contest. So I was fascinated by this story. So I went, I did a deep dive in, on newspapers.com and I found out that this story about this cat made headlines all over the country. Look at this, Alley Cat wins contest honors. Um, class will tell that Mr. Silver, a disreputable Alley Cat, a few days ago, ranked high Tuesday in the same place to be like girl. Okay, now they're, they're getting a little editorial here. Um, Alley Cat seeks refuge at a show from rain, wins two first prizes. Let's see. I like this headline over here. No pedigree, just charm. <laughs> Mr. Silver, this is a New York paper. Mr. Silver restores faith in catocracy. I mean, it's just absolutely charming. So this is when you have to start thinking, which is more important as a writer, technology or curiosity? I always think it's more important to be curious. And so I just spent time looking at this woman's face and trying to figure out what it was about her they decided to enter this cat. And what it was that was making her so happy. So this is what my first draft usually looked like. Here's my second draft. There's a third draft. I'm a very messy writer. I feel like this usually when I'm writing. Um, but I want to teach, especially you little ones, a trick. And for anybody who wants to write a book, this is a trick that I use all the time when I'm writing. I think of a story always like a clock. And I'll tell you, the first books that I wrote as a kid, they were very boring. They were very lineal, like this happened, and this happened, and this happened. But in the story, you have to take your, your reader on a journey. So I always start with the main character, say a straight cat, who has a problem. He doesn't have a problem. And then the bulk of the story is going to be the journey. Um, this, you could, this applies to any uh, fairy tale that, you, that you've read. Think of Hansel and Gretel, two characters, they're abandoned in the woods, they go on a, you know, they're trying to find um, you know, safety. Halfway through a story, your character always has to make a big decision. 
Um, Hansel and Gretel remember how they, they um, see that cottage made of candy and they decide whether or not to, to go check it out. The journey continues. We always like an oh no in a story. And Hansel and Gretel, um, the witch is trying to become. And then we have a <coughs> where Hansel and Gretel come up. So every story, I'm always using this fairy tale model or this sort of classic story model. Um, for this kind of story, I had to do some research, which is always fun. I start thinking about titles early on. It took me a couple tries to come to it. How Mr. Silver stole the show. Um, my sister is my illustrator. She's like when we were kids, and she starts drawing sketches, which are very cute. He knows how she makes his head tilt a little bit so he looks uh, a little more endearing. And I'm not going to read the whole story to you, but I was talking about the two things I'm always looking for in a story is change and emotion. And the emotion that I'm always trying to get is that bittersweet emotion at the end of, have you little ones read, have you read Charlotte's Web? You know at the end how it's like, it's sad but it's also kind of happy. That's the emotion that I'm always going for. So I got I, my favorite book review came from a, a first grader who, uh, from Columbia, Missouri, who sent me this book review. He said, "Thank you for the book. It was funny and it was sad." Oh, and I was like, "Oh, I totally got what I'm trying, what I'm trying to do." So I'm just going to pull up this really quick, and I will figure this out. I'll just show you how my sister took this story from, from the newspaper and brought it to life. So this is what my sister imagined 1947 St. Louis looking like. Here's Marcella Duffy, that nice hostess, who the change we're going to see her go through is she's so busy throughout the whole story. She's working and she needs the kitty. And here's the journey the fancy cats are coming. And I'm just going to read the last couple pages because you know the prompt, you know the setup that this cat is, um, is kind of finding a home in this hotel. Okay, what happened next is a mystery. Maybe it was the late hour. Maybe it was because it had been a long and exhausting day. Or maybe it was because she simply knew it was the right thing to do. For whatever reason, Miss Marcella Duffy saw it in those two remaining blue ribbons a chance. This is the end of the day, there are two blue ribbons left. This kitten must enter the contest, she announced to the kitchen staff. Yes, I'm quite sure of it. She used a smidgen of soap and a damp dishcloth to wash the cat. Then, using her own hairbrush, she groomed him. Here we go, she said, wish us luck. Her cat doesn't need luck, called the head waiter. He's got personality. Everybody loves an underdog to cheer the chef, especially when he's a cat. Miss Duffy escorted the kitten to the judge's table. Where are the documents acknowledging this cat's pedigree? asked the first judge. There are no documents, said Miss Duffy. How would you describe his ancestry? the second judge inquired. I wouldn't, replied Miss Duffy. Is he well bred? pressed the third judge. I haven't a clue, Miss Duffy replied. In that case, said the first judge, we can't possibly consider this. Just then, Louise appeared in the ballroom. Louise is the fictitious daughter of the chef. I invented her because I needed a child for the story. And Louise says, why can't you give him a chance? He's the sweetest cat here. Louise was right. There was something about the kitten. Even the judges could see it once they gave him a closer look. This cat was scrappy. He was curious. He was downright charming. After conferring for several minutes, the judges awarded the stray kitten not one, but two blue ribbons. The kitchen staff banged pots and pans to celebrate. Louise grabbed a handful of silverware and jangled it loudly. Quiet, please, scolded the first judge. To make this official, I must know the name of this cat. His name? asked Miss Dumpty, biting her lip. She had no idea what the kitten's name was. But then her eyes locked on Louise and the shiny silverware she was holding. His name, said Miss Duffy slowly. Oh, that's easy. The cat's name is Mr. Silver. 
Two days later, Mr. Silver made the front page of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. No pedigree, just charm, sang the headline of the St. Louis Star Times. Allie Cat wins contest honors, per the Cedar Rapids Gazette. The story was like catnip. No one could resist it. Nearly 100 newspapers across the United States and Canada ran the story of Mr. Silver's victory, along with his photographs. Mr. Silver was famous, but he was still a stray without a home. Mr. Silver couldn't stay at the Hamilton forever. He was a hotel for well-heeled people, not stray kittens. No one knew what to do. No one, that is, except Ms. Marcella Duffy. She took Mr. Silver to her apartment. As hostess of the Hamilton Hotel, Miss Duffy knew how to make any guest feel welcome. But of course, Mr. Silver was no longer Miss Duffy's guest. He was something much better. He was family. They were home. And this, this is a hand news thing. If you're writing a story that's based on a little bit of fact, a little bit of fact and a lot of fiction, you need this note from the author where you can say, this part is true, and this part I made up. Um, but again, for you little ones, I highly encourage you guys to use that circle trick I'm talking about, a character, a problem, a journey, a decision, I don't know, an aha. And you can use it to make a story for your mom, your dad, your grandma, um, your teacher, me, <laughs> anybody in your life. Um, and so now we're going to hear some facts about cats. <laughs> Well, I'm delighted to be here in this feline doubleheader, although it's a tough act to follow. Uh, what a wonderful book, uh, Mr. Silver, uh, Mr. Silver's fun to fill the short show is. So I'm going to tell you about my book and how I came to do it. If I can figure out how to get there. Uh, no, 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 no way. Here we go. Uh, I'll start talking as we get that up. My people who know me, my friends, and my colleagues, many of them were very surprised when I wrote this book on cats because I spend my life, my life, entire life has been all about lizards. And uh, there's a reason for that. I've been fascinated with lizards ever since I was a little boy. Um, this is where I went to nursery school, the Duke Chapel on Clayton Road. And here I am at nursery school. And I was, how many here, people here, how many kids here like dinosaurs? Are any dinosaur fans? We got a few, good. Well, I was that kid, maybe you were too, that went to nursery school with a basket full of plastic dinosaurs. And I knew all of their names and all of the facts. I was all dinosaurs all the time. And then when I got, oh, I have to point out, this is not actually me. This is my friend, Frank. <laughs> my wife dressed him up to look like me. <laughs> It's a little disturbing that my wife pictured me at age five in a bow tie. <laughs> that as it may. But then a couple years later, I switched from dead reptiles, from dinosaurs to living reptiles, to lizards. This is me at age 12 in Miami. I caught a little lizard. And so I was, I've been fascinated with reptiles my entire life. And that's what I do for my career. But at the same time as these pictures were taken, I also always <laughs> loved cats. In fact, this is me with my, our family's first cat. This is Tammy. She was adopted from the Animal Protective Association, which still exists on Hanley Road. And I was five, and we, we, got, we adopted Tammy to give my father for his birthday. And two years later, another rescue Siamese, Marisha, joined the family. And I've been crazy about cats my entire life. But as I grew older and I continued studying, the focus was on lizards and reptiles. This is me in graduate school in Costa Rica studying lizards. In fact, I spent my entire career studying one type of lizard. These are called animals. You may be familiar with them from Florida or elsewhere in the southeastern United States, or perhaps the Caribbean. There are, there are actually 400 species of this type of lizard. And I spent my career studying them, understanding how come they are so diverse? How particular species adapt to different environments in which they live? Uh, and as I develop, my scientific career developed, it never occurred to me to do anything scientifically with cats for two reasons. One is I wanted to study animals out in nature, to watch them, to see what they do. 
Now, has anyone here ever tried to follow a cat around to see what they do? <laughs> has anyone tried that? Did it work? No, because they figure out immediately what you're doing, and then they duck into the bushes and are gone. They no way to follow cats. So, not a good subject to study. It's very difficult to study them in nature. And there's another reason I didn't think about scientifically about cats, and that was I was under the impression that no one was doing research on domestic cats. Uh, I mean domestic cats, our pets and the stray cats, not lions and tigers. I just didn't think there was any interest in science going on. And then 10 years ago, I discovered I was wrong. This book was written by the world's leading authority on cat behavior, an English scientist named John Bradshaw, all about scientific research on domestic cats. And at the same time, the BBC put out this hour-long documentary about scientists studying cats in the English countryside in a little village. And it's a fantastic documentary. You can find it on the internet. Uh, but be careful because there are multiple books and movies with more or less the same name. But this one from 2012 is great. And what I learned was actually there is a lot of interesting science being done on, on cats. Uh, researchers were using all the cutting edge, uh, cutting edge methods that I use to study lizards and my colleagues used to study lions and hippos and elephants. They were using them to understand domestic cats. And so there was a lot of interesting research going on. And then I had what I only submit was a brilliant idea. I would teach a college class to freshmen called the science of cats. And the idea is that I would lure them to take the class because they like cats. And then I would teach them how we study animals in general, how we study nature, just using cats as the vehicle to explain these concepts. So I did teach that course. This was when I was teaching at Harvard. And uh, the course, I think, was a great success. We did a lot of fun things. I got college freshmen to get up before dawn to go on a field trip to the middle of Boston where people were feeding stray cats to see how these cats live. Actually, I think they didn't get up. Many of them just stayed up all night. But <laughs> anyway, they were there before dawn. Uh, we went to the Fog Art Museum where the curator talked to us about cats in, in art history. We met the resident Egyptologist, who turned out to be a big cat fan and had four Maine Coon cats, who told us all about cats in Egypt. And so we did all kinds of great things, and the students learned a lot. And I think it was a success because almost all of them ended up majoring in science, most of them in biology. So it seemed like, like the, the course went well. Now, at exactly the same time, I was just finish, finishing my first book for a general audience about evolution. I really liked writing that book. So it wasn't rocket science to put this together and think, why not write a book about cats and scientific research on cats and how we know what we know about cats. And so that led to the cat's meow. My goal was to tell the story of cats, where they came from, why they do what they do, what the future will hold. And it was to talk about how we know the answers to these questions, how science has informed us about cats. So that was the goal of this one. It was published earlier this year. And I want to tell you a little bit about some of the material in it and well, how this book got written based on the facts, as Kate said, and, and, and how I put them together. Uh, so I'm going to start with the name of the book, The Cat's Meow. Anyone who's lived with a cat knows that cats will meow to us. They're trying to tell us something. There's some sort of communication they're trying to do. I always assumed that cats uh, the cats meow to each other to communicate, and the fact that they meow to us simply indicates that they're treating us like cats, that we've achieved honorary cat status. However, I learned that people have studied colonies of cats that live outside, and they study them by watching the cats, just sitting and watching what they do, just like Jane Goodall does with chimpanzees and many other people do with other types of animals. What they found is that cats rarely meow to each other. Now, they make other sounds to communicate. They hiss, they snarl, they growl, but they don't meow to each other. So the fact that they meow to us is a trait that developed when they were domesticated. It evolved during the domestication process. Now, this might suggest that wild cat species don't meow. Maybe only the domestic cat meows. And so the question is, do other species of cats meow? Do you guys think that other species of cats meow? Anyone want to take a guess? Yes? No? 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 Who thinks they meow? Who doesn't think? Who thinks they don't meow? All right, well, let's find out. This is a bobcat. I 
contend that is a meow. It's a deeper sound because they're a bigger cat. You might not agree, but I think you're going to agree on this one. This is a cat from South Africa, a beautiful cat called a servo. <laughs> That's a meow. In fact, it turns out that all small species of cats meow. The large ones, the lions and tigers don't. The small species all meow. Well, that then leads to a question. Has the meow changed at all from the ancestor? Have they adapted the meows to living with us? And also, is there any meaning to the different meows that a particular cat will make at different times? This, these questions were investigated by this guy here, Nicholas Castro, who was a graduate student at Cornell. And this is the picture he sent, sent me when I asked him to send me a picture. <laughs> it tells you something about what kind of person he is. In fact, one of the most fun things about writing this book was meeting the people who did the research and learning. I asked them, what's the backstory of your research? You know, what happened during the study that didn't get into the paper? All the things that went wrong. And how did you become a cat researcher anyway? And one thing I learned was no one sets out in life to become a cat scientist. It just kind of happens through fluke, through happenstance. And so it was lots of fun getting people who were so generous with their time to learn their stories and then to try and present them in the book. Anyway, the Castro cat asked the question, has the domestic cat's meow changed from its ancestor? There's its ancestor, the African wild cat, beautiful species and throughout much of Africa. And so to find out how they meow, he went to South Africa, to the Pretoria Zoo, where they breed African wild cats. And he recording, recorded them meowing. And what he learned was that the, the meow of the African wild cat is different from that of domestic cats. It's, the domestic cat has a shorter meow that's higher pitched. And when he played the meows of the two species to people who just with headphones on, not telling them what they were, the people could definitely tell them apart and said that they much preferred the meow of domestic cats. And so what this indicates is that the domestic cat has evolved its meow in a way that make it more pleasing to our ears. Um, but the second question, what about the variation in the meow? Those of you who live with cats know that cats make different meows in different contexts. Why do they do this? Are they trying to tell us something? And is, is there any cat language where when they're hungry they meow one way and when they're scared they meow another way? Well, the Castro to do that, he recorded the meows of the same cat in five different contexts. When it was being petted, it was happy. When it was confined in a space that it didn't want to be in, say locked in a room. When it was about to be fed, when it was in an unfamiliar space, particularly in the Castro Park, or when it was being active, <laughs> And so we record these meows for many different cats. And the first thing we found is they definitely meow, have a different sound in different contexts. But there was no cat language. It's not that like every cat meowed when it was happy the same way, and meowed when it was being brushed back a different way. So they were different, but there was no consistency from one cat to another. And in fact, when he played those meows to people listening again on the headphones and asked them, which of these contexts do you think the cat was in? People couldn't, they, they were just, their answers were no better than guesses. Well, how, how do we explain that? That was answered by another British cat behaviorist, Sarah Ellis, who did the same experiment with one wrinkle. She included the people listening to the cats, the person who lived with that cat. And it turns out if you live with a cat, you can understand what the different meows mean. And when they heard their cat meowing, they couldn't correctly identify it. Oh, well, he's hungry. Or Oliver wants to get out of that room. And so it seems that there is a private language between a cat and the person that they live with where the cat makes different meows and people understand what they mean. And how this private language develops, we still don't know. And it develops differently for each cat and each person. But this is another trait that cats have evolved during domestication to get along with us. Now, I'm not going to talk about purring, the other signature sound that, uh, that domestic cats make. Other than to point out that other species purr as well. This again is a circle. And it is purring, just like a domestic cat. 
species. And in fact, all small species of cats also purr. And there's some great stories about how the domestic cat has changed its purring behavior. We're going to have time to get into that now. So I want to. There, so what do they use their purring for? Well, they have several different purrs, and they use them very strategically. I briefly want to, so part of what I did to write this book is I just read all of the scientific papers on cats, which took a long time, and then contacted many of the researchers to understand more about their studies. But another thing I did was I tried some of the cat research myself. For example, one thing research had been, researchers have been doing is putting little tracking devices on their collars to see where they go when they go outside. And it turns out you can buy those devices online. And so this is Winston, my cat in the backyard, and he's wearing this thing around his neck, his little tracker, that beams his location up into the satellites and then down into my iPhone every second. Here's a closer look at the tracker, just if you want to see what it's like, just put it on his collar. And here's my iPhone screen. It shows where he went on one particular day. This is where my house is, where that yellow mass is. Out there is the backyard, and at one point you can see he wandered up to the neighbors for a few minutes. So you can either follow them in real time or get a whole day's activity and get a sense of where they're going. Turns out most cats don't go very far, but a few cats do, do go quite a ways. The other, but of course that tells you where they go, not what they do. And uh, to then figure out what you do, you put a little camera on the cat, a kitty cam, which gives you the cat's eye view of where the cat is going. And this is a research study at the University of Georgia that's a little camera. And I, uh, oh no, I don't have, yes I do. So I don't have any pictures of Winston wearing his camera, but here it is. So you put it on his collar, you put it around his neck, and just as he's walking along, it's taking videos. Sometimes it's not so easy to figure out what he's looking at, but you get a sense of where he's going, and sometimes it's very clear. Oh, he jumped up to the top of the fence or something like that. So I did some of that as well. But the last thing I'll tell you about the experience I got that had a research orientation uh, ties back into case book. And that is, I went to a bunch of cat shows. And I'll tell you why I did that in a minute. But first, most people I meet aren't aware that such a thing as a cat show exists. But they do exist. And in fact, there are three in St. Louis every year. They're all held out at Purina Farms, which is Nestle Purina's research place, but they also have an exhibition hall out in Gray Summit near the Shaw Nature Reserve. And here's their uh, their big hall, a picture taken from, from the second floor, and each one of these little things has a cat in it. And so the cats are, they have been brought out there, they're waiting for their turn to be judged. And here's a closer look at these are what are called cat condos, where there are these two flaps, you put your cat in there, maybe two cats, a little food, a little water, and then you wait for them to be called out over the loudspeaker, and they're taken to the judging station, which are those light colored things at the side of the room. And then when they go to the judging station, the judge inspects the cats. And uh, there's not three judges all doing it at once. It's one, there are a bunch of judges, but each one looks at the cat independently. This woman is inspecting the tail of the cat. Here, the judge is using a feather to look at the face of the cat, get the cat's attention. Sometimes they have scratching posts to get a look at how their, their body moves, how vigorous they are. Here's some of the Siamese scratching the cat out to see if it's appropriately uh, tubular in shape. And so what they're doing is each breed of cat has its own, it's called a standard that the ideal cat looks like. And so they're judging, does this cat meet the breed standard? And then the judge explains their decision. So this is a prize-winning Persian cat that the judge is telling the audience, this is why this cat is so great. Let me show you a bunch of the different breeds of cats. And that's why I was interested. I'm an evolutionary biologist. I am interested in how species evolve and adapt. And what has happened with breeds of cats is that people have developed cats, some of them very different from their ancestors, some very different from any cat that has ever lived. And as an evolutionary biologist, I'm fascinated by what a cat can turn into. Now, is there is controversy. Some people think that pedigree cats aren't, they aren't very fond of them for a variety of reasons. I'm not going to get into that. As a scientist, I'm just interested in the variety of the cat show that you can see at a cat show. I love these guys. This is the largest species of domestic cat. They can get over 20 pounds. They look really mean. They're actually extremely gentle, very fluffy cats. It's the main coon. 
Here's the most beautiful of cats, the Bengal. There's a great story about how this breed was developed. Another breed developed to look like a tiger, a tiger or a cat in tiger pajamas. It's a stupid name, the Toyger. But um, <laughs> the Stanks, many people know the, the seemingly hairless cat. They have a very fine layer of fur. They're actually very healthy cats. You just don't want, wouldn't want to keep them out on a cold day. Uh, many breeds are developed around particular traits that evolve as a mutation. For example, a cat was born and its ears curled backwards when it was several months old. I don't know why people like that, but they then bred that cat and developed a breed of curly-eared cats. The cats are perfectly healthy, it's just an unusual look. Then there's some weird cats. This was a recently developed one, it's called the Lycoy. It has this very odd fur pattern. Sometimes it's called the werewolf cat, I think for obvious reasons. Its hair apparently all falls out about once a year, and then it grows back. It, Again, they seem to be perfectly healthy, just as odd appearance that some people find attractive. The munchkin, the corgi of cats. Um, they have short legs like corgis and dachshunds. It's the same mutation, the same mutation that occurs in people. A lot of people don't like this breed. Uh, they actually are healthy. The dachshunds and corgis have spinal issues, but cats are built differently and they seem to be perfectly healthy. Some breeds have been changed over time. This is the classic look of the Siamese. These were the two Siamese that I grew up with. Typical looking cat, ears, normal position, normal size, a typical triangular face. This is the modern day award winning Siamese. You can see that they've become very slender, a wispy tail, long, slender legs. Look at the size of those ears and how off to the side they are, and the, the head has been elongated. I don't know why anyone has done, why would you breed it? a cat to look like this, but they have. Um, they created a cat unlike anything that has ever existed. And speaking of which, finally the Persian cat may be the most extreme, at least in some respects. Particularly, if some people believe find their faces to be very sweet looking. Um, on the other hand, they have no nose. The external nose is, is gone. They just have two little nostrils. And that is actually bad for the cat. So this should not happen because it causes breathing issues and problems with their, their tear ducts. Uh, but again, there's no cat like this that's ever existed. So as an evolutionary biologist, it is interesting that one could be created by breeding over a relatively short period of time. Anyway, that's my interest in cat shows. They are entertaining if you want to take a see this variety of cats. But you probably have one big question on your mind. And I think that probably is, oops, there's a person. Could Mr. Silver steal the show today? And the reason I bring that up is if you think about what I just told you, the judges compare all the Siamese cats to the Siamese, all the Persians to the Persians, and so on. Poor Mr. Silver has no papers, he's not pedigree. Would he have a chance? You, you might think not, but in fact, there is hope. Because there's now a category called the household pet category at cat shows. And so if you have a wonderful cat, and you think your cat is beautiful and great, you can enter it in the household pet category, and the judges will examine them all and give ribbons to the best household cat. So Mr. Silver could win even today. Uh, a couple last notes. I'm teaching my cat course again at Washington, not that I'm here at Washington University. It's just so much fun. And last thing I want to tell you about the title of my book, or rather the different title of the British version of my book. It's got a different title and a different uh, cover. And the book's word inside the book is absolutely the same. In fact, they didn't even change it to British spelling with a U for color or anything like that. But they had a different title. And there's two reasons for that. One is I was I was told to expect this. The British have a different sensibility. No, I'm sorry, that's about the cover. We'll talk about you see a very different cover. They have a different sensibility. For a book like this, was sort of a science and a nonfiction factual thing, they want a book that says, this is a serious treatment. It's a more refined cover. And so the American book, there was never a question that there would, whether there would be a kitten on the cover. Of course there would be. I think for the British, by the same token, they never considered a kitten. They also changed the title for a different reason. It turns out that the title, The Cat's Meow, doesn't mean anything in England. It doesn't mean something that's great like it does here. And so when they saw the title, like, this is a book about cat communication. Well, it is a little bit, but not the whole book. And so they changed the title so it would make sense to the British. And so that's how I got a book. Actually, two different books out of one manuscript, if you will. So with that, I'm going to leave you with a picture of Nelson on my other cats, who stars in the book, and um, 
Thank you so much for including me. And thank you for that. Audience questions. Does anyone have a question for either of our authors? Do we sit up here? Sure. I have to say the best the best chapter of the Bible, I think, is Lights, Kitty Cam in Action. <laughs> so one of the things I found when I put the kitty can you hear me okay? Yeah. When I put the kitty cam on Winston and also Jane, another cat, is they spend most of the time doing nothing. <laughs> and um, and it's really boring. So these little kitty cameras, so the professional kitty cameras used by the researchers have a mo motion detector that if the kitty cam doesn't move, it stops filming. And so it doesn't chew up the battery and it doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't, you don't have to sit and watch nothing. But it turns out your cat's sitting there on the porch doing nothing, but it's looking around. And it's enough to keep the, the video rolling. Or it turns out that this, we're going to put it in my pocket, turns out these are kind of cheap and they're supposed to stop filming when it's inactive, but they don't. So <laughs> watching these videos is like so boring because nothing is happening for most of the time. But then they do something that's interesting. But most of the time, they do not. Um, you mentioned it in this one that you go a little bit towards such future potentials of evolution. Did you find any research or talk, you talk about any of the possibilities of making our cats, um, altering the cats to make people less allergic to them through their dander? Absolutely. Yeah. And that's a fast How far away do you think that technology or that? Uh, that is from happening? So there are several approaches to this. and. I mean, so some of them are quite close. The most extreme might not be that far away, but let me explain. So it turns out a shockingly large number of the population around the world is allergic to cats, somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of people. And the reason they're allergic is that cats produce a protein in their saliva, and then when they lick their fur and lick their skin, the protein is spread on their fur, and then it dries off and flakes off into the air and becomes dander. But many people are allergic to that. Well, scientists have known for some time what the gene is that makes that protein. And so what is going on now, uh, you may have heard of the idea of gene therapy, where people have a disease because the gene has a mutation. And so yeah, the idea to, with CRISPR, to, to fix the gene, uh, to make it work right. Well, this is the opposite. The idea is to use CRISPR to break the gene so that it doesn't produce the allergen and you would have an allergen-free cat. And there's a company that has got the CRISPR working in the test tube on a petri dish. And the question is, could they do it for a, a living cat? Now, there is, I mean, some people, immediate response is well, that, that that protein might be there for a reason, and it might be bad for the cat. And that is possible. But the fact is that cats vary tremendously in how much of this protein they produce. And some naturally produce very little amounts of it. But those cats seem perfect, perfectly healthy. So there's reason to believe it wouldn't hurt, harm the cats, but that definitely needs to be researched. So that may be not too far away. The other way to do this is there are other ways to get rid of the production of that allergen. There's a Nestle Purina produces a cat food already that they claim reduces the amount of allergen produced by a cat by 50%. And there's a vaccine that was in the news this spring that apparently, not the vaccine for people, but for the cats, that would reduce the amount of allergen they produce. And they claim that would be on the market next year. I don't believe it when I see it, but anyway, it is it, it is a science, science actually might be able to That'd help with this issue. Agreed. It's one of the most common reasons that cats are turned back to shelters is because you take it home and discover someone in the house is allergic. So if they could, Solve that problem would be really great all around. Who did you the books from? He goes through like, a pretty extensive. Like, we have a anti danger. Is it a water waterless shampoo? Yeah, like he gets anti dander shampoo, and then we have a spray that we spray on all of like the rugs and carpets as well to help break down those proteins. Yeah. Uh, my question was actually involving the books for that. Um, is there science behind, like, he is an 
um, all of our books are against them. And they're kind of afraid of kids. Some kids, they really warm up to. Um, so like the particular kids like come in quite that like the cats will be friends with. But in general, most of the kids are kind of scary for the cats. Is there science behind? Like, is it just like reddish poison? Like, so with kids but not adults, mostly. I mean, Orleans is very, very tender. Uh, Spike was not. And where are the cats coming from? Where do you get um, from the shelter? No, just like alleys. Like, they have all that like, found out in. They just wander in. Uh, Spike was found in, in uh, not in the band. He was not in a work site, uh, but outside. And Orleans snuck his way into someone's house. Uh -huh. okay. And were they kittens when they were first, uh, or were they already adult cats? Orleans was about a year. Well, we think probably about a year when he came to the bookstore. Uh, so I was So uh, there's a couple of things. One is that uh, the friendliness of a cat is determined to a large extent by their experience at a very young age. There's a window between about three and nine weeks where how they interact with people will affect the rest of their lives. And so you get a kitten when it's three or four weeks old and you pet it, you're gentle and you love on it. That's a cat that will be well adjusted and do well around people. Many cats that are born in alleys and so on, they, they never interact with people and then that window passes. And then it's really hard to, you know, you can get cats to be more socialized, it's very difficult to get a cat to be really um, warm. But the best practices that shelters have at raising kittens is to give them a lot of handling and attention, uh, but also to make sure that it's not just one person and not just women who often are there, but because you do that, they might be learning to be very friendly to, to women, but not to men or the children. And so if they've never interacted with a child, it may well be that they consider a different species than <laughs> And then on the other hand, of course, some children just are, you know, their freneticness can be intimidating, perhaps as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Anyone for Kate? Oh, yes, right there. How did you call the other scientists? How did I how did I talk to them? Like how how did you yeah. how did you know? How did I know them? So they write, they write papers describing what they learned about cats. And so I read those papers, and then I found out their email address on the internet, and I sent them an email and said, I'm very interested in your paper. Could I give you a phone call to, to ask you some questions? Or sometimes I just type the questions. Most people were very generous in spending time talking to me and answering questions. But most of the people I had never met before. A few of them I knew, but most of them I'd never met before, but they were really, almost all of them, very kind to me to, to tell me. Turns out you ask people about their research, they're happy to talk for a long time, just like I did up to here. So, um, <laughs> but that's how I, I got to know them. Good question. Yes. Kate, can I ask you a question? Yes, please. So, how much of, was there any, Guidance in those articles, and the story was very similar. Cat to stray cat gets adapted and wins two blue ribbons. Was there any other information, or did you just kind of figure out? There, there was information. There were there were little tidbits about that the Marcella W used her hairbrush to brush the cat and that sort of thing. But when you're writing for young readers, you're always writing a story that this age will like, but also for the adult. So I, I was focused on the cat story and also personal. Because I, I, I saw them both as outsiders, kind of. I mean, it's 1947. She was probably running the hotel during the war. You know, the guys come home, she's back being the hostess. I felt, you know, I felt that the relationship between the two was a thing that I was interested in. And I, 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 wanted, I wanted to be factual, but I also needed to invent a young character. Um, and so I, I kind of just, uh, uh, but no, I, I mean, there's a toast bird in the beginning. I found that in 1947, a new kind of toaster was invented. So I kind of used that as a way for them to meet each other, the burning toast. Uh, so there are, little, there are little facts sprinkled through, but you know, 
it's a little more freedom than you do. And the, the name Mr. Silver, was that made up or was there something well, that was, his name? That's what his name was, but I didn't, there was no reason, I had to come up with a reason why she would call him that. So I used the silver word. So I have to say, in, in one of the things that was fun for me in my book was getting little facts like that in his paper, but then asking the researcher, you know, sometimes they listed the names of their cats from when they put collars on them. And I said, well, tell me about Oliver or something. And getting these little facts that otherwise, because the people were still around. And, yes, yes, yes. And, and I thought that was really fun to add that. To, yeah. To bring the, the, the challenge for, for this book is this 1947 St. Louis, which, as you can imagine, St. Louis was not a very welcoming place for outsiders, women, people of color. So I kind of had to find a way to tell that story as well. I mean, it's a fancy hotel. There would have been no black people in the dining room. So we had to kind of go back and forth. Are we going to really have a children's book where there are no black people? In the dining room, well, you can, you have to because it's 1947 St. Louis. But then that's why we have the, uh, the chef's daughter. We kind of broke the color barrier and let her go in. So there, there are a couple layers that um, I like playing with. So yeah. they're all. They're, I feel like I always have to tell two or three stories in a thousand words, which is it's fine. Julie, do you have a question over there? Okay. No, I was just curious um, when it comes to working with your sister and like the artistic vision, meaning the like the text. Like, do you do you feel like after all your stories now, like like as it's coming together, do you like, trust that you're both kind of imagining the same thing, or do you just turn that over to her? And, and like, do you, how much input do you have back and forth? Like, oh, that's not really how I envisioned it. She's. We grew up on the same. My mom would read to us the same books every night. I was in one bed, Sarah's in the other. Sarah would always crawl out to look at the pictures. <laughs> be too lazy, so I would just like think about my own stuff. I defer her completely on the visuals. Uh, and we, we have we have a very similar sensibility, so I trust her completely. Yeah, I love the way it's amazing. Um, I had a question, you know, this is a little bit more of a bit. It's always surprised me that we read about these Bengal tigers in India that are surprisingly lethal go to great lengths to avoid them. And uh, that brings up the whole question about cats and humans interacting. Of course, out in the West, we're seeing a lot more mountain lions, cougars. Uh, is it, are some cat species kind of too close to, to humans and they're, they're... Well, this is a big issue. They are big lethal predators and um, so they can you know they can the bigger cats can kill people also they're quite dangerous if they're if they're threatened or if they feel their kid their cubs are threatened and in you know there's a little bit different the situation in the US obviously compared to say India or Bangladesh but in in Indian Bangladesh the amount of habitat is uh, you know, they've cut down a lot of the forest and the agricultural land and so on. And in fact, there are some cases where, you know, there's just no room for the cats and that they go off, you know, they get out and anyway, some of them end up hunting people. And it is true, often those are, are um, injured animals or too old animals, often, but not always. But, but again, you get people who are living out and they have to be in those places where the cats are for whatever they, they do to get by, and it does happen. And, you know, it's a problem with a lot of people in the world, and a lot of who want to preserve the animals, well, they need a place. It's hard to coexist with big predators. And, you know, in the, in the U.S., it's a little bit different uh, because the mountain lions made a remarkable recovery because they've been protected in most places, and they're coming back. But... Most there have been a few attacks now, and that's usually people who are hiking or something, and in the cat's habitat. But there was a, a, a fabulous um, documentary a few years ago showing the cats in L.A., which you may have heard about. But they are in L.A. in the in the because L.A. you know has a bunch of mountains and within the city, the cats are there. And uh, there was a documentary with a helicopter flying over with an infrared camera and the sea's heat. You've seen that with you know, fugitives running. I showed this mountain lion walking 
along the creek behind people's backyards. And mostly they stay away from people who are afraid of them, but it can happen. And you know, it's one of these things. Um, if you're gonna have wild animals like that, these things will happen. And it can you know they changing subject slightly, uh, Colorado recently had a referendum where they very narrowly passed a statewide whatever it was telling the Department of Conservation to bring back wolves into Colorado because they they were also being very successful. The city people loved it. You know, the romantic idea of wolves roaming the, the mountains of, of Colorado. The rural people hated it because they actually have to live with them. And it's their sheep and their their animals that are. So I mean, these are very difficult issues, but you know, cats can be lethal. On the other hand, there was a study in um, some part in Africa recently where they played sounds of different animals and people, and the one sound that all the animals ran away from was people. So, you know, they're in most cases more afraid of us than we are. With them. There are there are leopards in I think it's Bombay. There's a big national park that abuts into I think it's Bombay, and these leopards come into the city and, and kill dogs and other things. But they pretty much avoid the people, I think, usually. You know, I think it's cool. There's leopards in the, in the park right next to Bombay, but if I lived in the little places where they come, I think I'd have a different opinion of it. <laughs> Let's have another round of applause for our friends. All right. If you would like to get a book signed this evening, we will do that right up here in the front. Uh, we do have books available for sale in the back, and I want to thank you all for coming.